let's uh, let's get started. Uh, Bobby's going to take over here tonight, and he's going to to walk us through some of the things that came out of a uh, period called the Great Awakenings, and we're going to end up in the early 1900s by the end of the lesson. So I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to turn it over to Bobby, and we're going to get started. Okay, let's pray. God, you're great. Uh, we have enjoyed looking at the history of your people over the last 2,000 years. Pray that you be with Bobby tonight and help him to present uh, this lesson to us to, to help us learn more and understand how um, how things have changed over the years and uh, have uh, how things have um, well slowly over time become to to what Christendom is now. Uh, again, be with Bobby and help him to do a great job presenting this material. Uh, we love you and thank you for this opportunity to have this teaching ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Tom. So let's see here. Okay. All right. So tonight we're going to be discussing Great Awakenings. This is the fourth installment in our church history series. Um, and I myself have just been so grateful and encouraged for those that have come before me, uh, because honestly, this has been a great learning experience. Um, and it's just so cool that we get to see God's hand working through time. Uh, there's a really great quote from C.S. Lewis that we'll read uh, in a little bit later, but I think it's so helpful how we kind of structure our thoughts around history and its value in our present day lives. So today we're going to be talking about this time period, the Great Awakenings, uh, that really shaped the modern Christian American landscape. Um, and it had some worldwide impacts too, uh, but much more so here within America. And it helps explain a lot of the current status of Christianity um, that we have today. So in his Church History in Plain English book, uh, Bruce Shelley writes, Shortly after the dawn of the 18th century, two types of Puritan heirs were visible. The spiritual heritage fell to the children of the Great Awakening. The call for personal conversion as the basis of church membership soon echoed throughout the Connecticut River Valley through the preaching of Jonathan Edwards. The worldly Puritans continued the Puritan sense of civic responsibility and concern for lawful government, even when they could no longer feel the dread of living before an awesome lord of history, these colonialists still held that empires rose or fell depending on whether men obeyed or disobeyed the designs of divine providence. They believed, for example, that God smiled upon the quest of liberty. The Great Awakening knew both the frown and smile. Of God. It restored both the tears of repentance to colonial Christianity and the joy of salvation. So as we look at this tonight, I think it's helpful for us to remember the scripture that Tom shared in the first class, Daniel 2, 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. And as we look through the study of church history, we have constantly been seeing this interaction of worldly power and spiritual power um, and how both can cause interaction and change in the other. And that specifically, we can be influenced negatively by the politics of this world if we let ourselves be, if we let the church succumb to that. So looking at the 1700s, this is a world that is waking up to the reality that there are many, many people with different ideas, fears, hopes 
um, and that there is a wide net, a myriad of belief systems and structures. Uh, and so as different empires kind of rise and fall and try to bring about their view of how the world should be seen, uh, there's this massive interchange of culture um, that creates kind of a breeding ground, a breeding ground for new ideas and questioning one's beliefs and ideas. And certainly too, this time period is, is heavily operating under Enlightenment's influence. This greater focus on thinking, reason, analysis, it's causing some to question faith entirely. Um, and it's causing others to question their practices of faith. Two, this is during the Industrial Revolution. You know, this, this massive change in how things were produced, uh, this switch from the, the agricultural age to, to now, um, it's causing a massive influx of people into city centers, this, this great migration. Um, and with that comes also a great exploitation of workers. While this time period is creating for the first time a, a middle class, people that are not fully in charge, but also not serving completely as, as serfs or slaves to others. Um, but still many, many people are being exploited. Um, and you can imagine why, right? If you start just having all sorts of people come to uh, one city at the same time without the infrastructure to support it, there, there's terrible misery until the systems can be built around to support that. Uh, but of course, we know from the Sermon on the Mount that God is not far off, that, that he's there with the poor in spirit. And so, so this kind of misery and opportunity that's being created by such a revolution it is creating fertile soil for God to work in the hearts of men. And then too, it's a time of political revolution. Obviously, we, we know that the American Revolution happened during this time, uh, but the reality was at this point, all sorts of groups are rising up against their oppressors, against other worldly influences, against foreign power structures. And this will continue heavily for the next 200 years, kind of culminating in World War I and World War II, where finally all the, the great empires are broken down. Um, but yeah, people, people are, are no longer putting up with uh, foreign power. And finally, there's a time of religious revolution. So you have the Catholics, the Calvinists, the Church of England, uh, various Anabaptist sects, each trying to understand God's will and act upon it properly in this new age. But, you know, again, kind of think about where we're at in terms of the Reformation. Already some of those reformations of faith have already become themselves tradition. And what started with, with just groups of people saying, hey, something is wrong, let's ring the alarm, let's do something different, have turned into their own belief systems and structures. Um, and, and really, they became these new traditions that were causing preachers to really focus on rebirth over just baptism. Uh, and so just this concept of people would kind of lean into their baptism, be like, oh, well, I'm a baptized Lutheran. And that's just how it is. Uh, it has created a unwillingness for further change and further transformation in Christ's image, uh, which caused then the preachers to really try to focus on this kind of idea of renewal or rebirth. Uh, and that's going to be really important as we look through this time period. And finally, um, many in this age were actually less pious than we, we perhaps would perceive or think. Uh, some estimates that, that during this time period in the southern states, as few as one in 50 people would have considered themselves a, a practicing Christian, which almost seems like outrageous to us. Um, but it's just wild that it was not as like, oh, everyone fell in line as we might perhaps think, uh, especially because in New England, there was far a greater Christian influence than most some of the other places in America at that time. So in this massive wellspring of potential change and all sorts of different forces operating upon humanity, um, Methodism is one of the things that really springs out of, of this, this, again, fertile soil. And, you know, we are familiar with the song, what started in a Bible talk. Um, and honestly, that's what happened with Methodism. Uh, there was a, a small group of, of guys. They just started the Holy Club at Oxford University, uh, George Whitfield, John and Charles Wesley and others. 
Um, and so, you know, Brother Charles, he, he started the Holy Club in, in roughly 1729. Uh, they were known as Bible Moths, Methodists, the Reforming Club, and Sacramentarians. Um, they were mocked for their beliefs, uh, like many who try to hold on to things uh, from a Christian standpoint are. And one of the names that they were mocked with, the Methodists, actually kind of stuck. And in the same way that the early disciples were mocked as Christians, little Christs, uh, they, they kind of wore it as a badge of honor. Um, and so in those early years, you know, a couple of years when they were all kind of out of school, George really took the reins, but then really helped John eventually find his place supporting this massive movement for God. Um, the group was, was known for its piety, its devotion, its interpersonal accountability and commitment to study. Uh, some of them committed to three hours of Bible study every day. No questions. There's a quote by Henry Skogel that, that heavily influenced this group. True religion is a union of the soul with God. It is Christ formed within us. And George Whittefield later said, though I had fasted, watched and prayed and received the sacrament long, yet I never knew what true religion was. He considered himself converted in 1735, although he had been attached to the church before then. And he was well known for emotional preaching calling others to the same new birth that he experienced, this, this final understanding of, of what true religion is, so to speak. And he was an incredible orator. He was you know, filled with passion. He would often imitate biblical characters uh, for effect in his speeches. Um, and you know, we, this is important as we look at the Great Awakening, because we see this kind of a common theme throughout that. With all that fertile soil of change, it just took the right emotional offer, or in some cases, the right emotional manipulation of the gospel uh, to have mass impact on crowds and, and to truly change people from point A to point B. Now, George Whittefield had, had some early conflict with the Anglicans, the Church of, of um, uh, England. I am fully convinced there is a fundamental difference between us and them. They believe only in outward Christ. We further believe that he must be inwardly formed in our hearts also. And so because of this conflict with the Church of England, um, he really had no place to go to preach indoors, even though he was a grifted, uh, gifted preacher. And so he headed right outside. And he would end up drawing crowds 20 to 50,000 people in size. And think about that. No sound equipment, no auditoriums perfectly built for acoustic measure. Um, in large fields, he would draw these crowds. Uh, Braxton Boren did a sound study, and here's a, a quote from this study. We then set up a computer model of the sites of Whitefield's largest, of, of Whitefield's largest reported congregations in London using a virtual George Whitefield preaching to a crowd filling the entire area of space. We had to account for different levels of background noise as Whitefield made it clear that some crowds were quiet while others were boisterous or unruly. Four different sites, for different sites, our model predicted that Whitefield had a maximum intelligible area of 25,000 to 30,000 square meters under optimal conditions. A solid crowd over that area would constitute about two people per square meter leading to an overall crowd of 50 to 60,000. However, if the crowd was slightly noisier or if Whitefield was a little hoarse, uh, you know, if there was weather problems, the intelligible crowd area could decrease quickly. And so this guy was drawing cloud crowds that were the absolute max that science would, would allow sound to carry. Um, so he was definitely loud. He was able to project his voice in a great way. Um, and he was quoted as saying, all the world is my parish when he was getting some heat from the church for not sticking to just one local area. So he moved to the American colonies in 1739, and he really helped unite these various revival winds that were blowing in the different areas of the colonies at that point in time. And he continued to be heavily influential and in kind of helping the, the Wesley brothers find their way. So as for the Wesley brothers, 
John Wesley, he became convinced of the impossibility of being half a Christian, uh, and he was ordained to the Anglican Church in 1728. He was ardent to have his life match doctrine, both of them. They visited prisoners. They served the poor. They were devoted to Bible study. Um, they tried to find any realistic practice that ought to be happening in the scriptures and live it out. And yet, both reported feeling an inner emptiness, like, like something was missing. And so his, his brother, Charles, he was much more opposed to the separation with Church of England that was kind of forming between this little Methodist group um, than some of his other contemporaries. He ended up writing 6,500 songs and hymns for Methodist meetings. Uh, many of which you would recognize. Hark the Herald Angel Sings is uh, one of his, his popular ones. And wow, <laughs> think about that. Imagine sitting down and being like, okay, let me write out a song that I would feel good about the congregation singing or a hymn for us and, and knocking out one today and then saying, okay, you know what? I'm going to do, do another one the next day and the next day. If you did that for 17.8 years straight, <laughs> you would have caught up to Charles here. Uh, so both him and his brother were absolutely were, were diligent workers when it came to the faith. But what's interesting is that those early years of devotion never felt complete to him. Um, it wasn't until 1738, nine years after he had started this holy club and had gone preaching in places and, and had already been writing before he actually felt that he had converted to the faith. And, you know, this is another really, really important point that existed in this time period. When we ourselves are united with Christ through baptism, in faith, um, as part of the church, we are confident of our salvation. And we don't have these, these horrific inner thoughts constantly chewing away like, okay, is it real? Is it real? Is it real? And, and when you look at the Wesley stories, it is very clear that they were, they were facing this problem of, of not really knowing if their salvation was certain. So as for his brother, um, Bruce Shelley writes, towards the end of 1736, the good ship Simmons bound for Savannah, Georgia, sailed into a series of violent Atlantic storms. The wind roared, the ship cracked and quivered, the waves lashed the deck. A young, slightly built Anglican minister on board was frozen in fear. John Wesley had preached the gospel of eternal salvation to others, but he was afraid to die. He was deeply awed, however, by a company, by a company of Moravian brethren from Hernhut. As the sea broke over the deck of the vessel, splitting the mainsail in pieces, the Moravians calmly sang their psalms to God. Afterward, Wesley asked one of the Germans if he was frightened. No, he replied. Well, weren't your women and children afraid? Wesley asked. No, said the Moravian. Our women and children are not afraid to die. This, Wesley wrote in his journal, was the most glorious day I have ever seen. And so at, at this moment, John Wesley, having his early start, being ordained into the ministry, heading over to, to the, the colonies to, to work for the gospel, he recognized that he had not yet found the faith that's then at a peace that surpasses all comfort. And so he was absolutely an unlikely candidate for leadership in a spiritual awakening that's soon, soon to shake England to its moorings. He had a form of godliness, but he had yet to find its power. So later, writing about his trip, essentially on the return, he said, you know, I went to America to convert the Indians, the Native Americans, but oh, who shall convert me? And honestly, this, this trip was a disaster. It ended in complete disgrace for him. Um, he had chased, ap chased after a young woman, Sophie Hopke, uh, and after she denied his pursuits and married somebody else, he barred her from communion and didn't allow her to participate in communion in the church that they were a part of. 
uh, which obviously did not go well. <laughs> um, and so he, he ended up kind of heading back to England in disgrace. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, he went and visited the Moravians. He was like, okay, well, maybe let me try to get, get some, some sense of balance uh, based on that interaction that I had with them on the ship. And while he spent time with them and was very impressed by their beliefs and their devotion, um, he was concerned about some aspects of, of their community living and, and specifically felt like there was kind of a cult of personality around their main leader. And so he, he said some negative things about that to them. And he quickly also had a fallout with the Moravians and then was back in England. So in 1738, the same year as his brother Charles, actually just a few days later, um, he had this experience. I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter to nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the laws of sin and death. And so, you know, we're going to look a little bit more about how John fell into this camp of Ar Arminians versus others who, who fell in this camp of Calvinism um, and whether or not salvation was predestined. But again, there was just this, this horrible fear in the hearts of many of, of when is that moment? When do I know? When, when is salvation obtained? And you already see how some of the effects of the, the Reformation and the inability for people to agree on how that worked was causing distrust in people's hearts towards God. So shortly after that moment, he had kind of a, a Pentecost moment. Um, and this is really, you know, these, these revivals were just starting to get rolling. He preached to 3,000 crowd in Bristol in 1739 and, and saw the impact of how people were moved by the scriptures, were moved by the gospel. Um, and finally, he felt like he was doing exactly what God intended for his life. From that point forward and, and for the rest of his life, he ended up traveling over 250,000 miles, a quarter of a million miles, preaching across Britain, the colonies, and gave over 40,000 sermons, which are massive numbers any way that you look at it. Uh, he mainly traveled on horseback, and he often would do this slowly and let the horse kind of go at its own pace and, and let loose the reins, while he would ride on its back, reading and preparing sermons, going from town to town. So it, again, he held to this Arminian point of view that all men could receive God's will salvation, that God intended all men to be saved. Uh, compared to most of his contemporaries, which really strongly supported Calvinism, this idea that the elect are predestined. And this created in the future many splits in the Methodist church. He was widely considered an administrative genius. We'll look at that a little bit in terms of how that related to the, the Methodist model, um, copying from place to place. At 86, Wesley wrote this in his journal. I am now an old man, decayed from head to foot. My eyes are dim, my right hand shakes much, my mouth is hot and dry every morning. I have a lingering fever almost every day. However, blessed be God, I do not slack my labor. I can preach and write still. Again, him and his brother both committed to using every ounce of energy that they had for God's, God's will as they perceived it. So this, this Methodist model, right, uh, it started really as a church within a church. Um, both John and his brother, they did not want to separate from the Church of England. They didn't want to leave the, the Anglicans and, and start their own thing. Uh, but this really came down to a breaking point in 1773. Uh, John had organized a large conference of preachers and really needed some church ordained leaders to serve at that meeting. And so he kind of appealed to the bishop in, uh, in England 
didn't get a response. And so he just took it upon himself. He appointed a couple, uh, as well as making a superintendent of the American Methodists, which kind of essentially formally broke. And if you look at the time in there, 1773, considering everything else that was going on between the colonies and England, it's not very surprising that, that this break happened when it did. So the way that the Methodists operated at this point of time were in these small groups called classes and, you know, not from a, a teaching sense, a class, but instead kind of like a division. Um, they would be groups of accountability, testimony, prayer. Uh, they were, were kind of capped at 12 people in size with one lay leader that was not formally ordained for, by the church. And if you look at that, <laughs> you should be very familiar with that system. Um, that is how we, for the most part, operate life teams and, and small groups and, and this idea of a small group of disciples coming together and trying to live out God's will together and trying to serve the poor together and praying and, and reading and giving their testimony to each other. That's, that's, that's how we see it. Um, and so as this movement continued to grow and grow and grow, uh, John was kind of very administratively uh, minded, and so he created layers of preachers and, and leaders to try to help keep the groups rolling and, and pointing in the same direction. Um, and, you know, the spread of the Methodist church was, was wild. Uh, at this point in time, there's approximately 80 million people worldwide that consider themselves some segment of, of Methodist. The largest grouping of that is the United Methodist Church. Um, and honestly, if you go to most tiny towns in America, you're going to be able to find a, a United Methodist Church not too far away at all. They had a real heart to try to make sure that people had the opportunity to know God in their local area. So the, the movement here, it, it helps stimulate love for the poor, overseas mission, social care for the church, and, and really this idea of fantastic preaching that led people to get connected to a community and then try to live life in a small group, it, it worked in terms of people trying to live out their, their view of God's will. So now let's go ahead and turn our attention to Isaac Bacchus and religious freedom. So this guy, you know, he's a Connecticut farm boy. He, uh, he grew up believing that society was protected by natural order of church and government aligning and, and working well together. But he's really an excellent case study in how the, the Great Awakening came and, and shook people's lives up. So at 17, his mother was converted by the Great Awakening and, and kind of had this sort of like uh, new life experience or, or rebirth. And then he shortly thereafter, too, felt called to repent. He described it as, I was enabled by divine light to see the perfect righteousness of Christ and the freeness and riches of his grace with such clearness that my soul was drawn forth to trust him for salvation. Shortly thereafter, he, he joined this group of revivalists and then eventually the Baptists. Uh, he ended up being, being a, a, um, a big supporter of the Baptist movement. He formed the First Baptist Church in Middleborough, Massachusetts, and was by far the greatest force in promoting the view of church and state that Americans now hold to, uh, truly advocating for religious freedom. He said... God has appointed two different kinds of government in the world, which are different in their nature and ought never to be confounded. And, you know, it's funny is, is during this time period, re revivalists like Isaac and rationalists, people that are coming out of this like deist mindset and like maybe believe there is some God, kind of this idea of those like, um, non-religious pious that like understand, okay, there should be chasing of freedom, different things. Many of the founding fathers uh, of, of this nation, they created this alliance um, and they were operating from, from truly two completely different worldviews, uh, one based in faith and, and one that was rejecting faith. But they were able to fully agree that any type of coerced uniformity under a state established religion could not withstand this new age of reason and revolution. Revolution, Like essentially people aren't going to put up with 
being in a religion, a religion that they don't actually believe. Um, and we cannot stop people from having these religious beliefs. And so, you know, this, this alliance, it, it worked. Isaac Bacchus and his fighting for religious freedom, it became uh, completely part of the American system, if you will. Obviously, the, the First Amendment of the Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Now, you know, many people will, will summarize down the First Amendment into freedom of speech, but look at the very first thing there. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That is the First Amendment to the Constitution. So now let's turn our attention to the, the sinner's prayer, because this is such an important concept in terms of how Christianity is perceived today. Um, and so there was an excellent article by Steve Staten that I'm pulling much of this material on that really helps kind of draw through some of the things that we've already discussed through this period of the Great Awakenings, through some of these other revivals that, that followed um, into the modern day sinner's prayer. So we're gonna, we're gonna kind of trace down that, that thread together. So starting with the Reformation, right? This allowed the general populace to, to read the scriptures for the first time and helped revive people's waning faith, but there was no consensus on issues, um, even between the Protestants. And again, kind of what I mentioned before, this, this concept of like, I am a baptized Lutheran and that's that. Um, preachers at this time were very concerned with people using that as a smokescreen to not address ongoing change and transformation in their lives. And so it, what ended up happening is the influence of preachers trying to fight against that. It led to this popular notion that, that you know, one could be forgiven with infant baptism, but not yet actually reborn, not having this rebirth or something along those lines. And honestly, many Protestants were confused or ambivalent about the connection between rebirth and forgiveness. So moving into the Great Awakening, um, it was a result of this intense emotional preaching that was addressing a wounded people in a rapidly changing society. Um, there was major misuse of Revelation 3. Uh, and so John Webb, he missed, this is reading from, from Staten's article, John Webb misused this passage in the mid 1700s as a basis of evangelizing non-Christians. Here is a promise of union to Christ. In these words, I will come into him. In essence, if any sinner will but hear my voice and open the door and receive me by faith, I will come into his soul and unite him to me and make him a living member of that, my mystical body, of which I am the head. And when you start to have people taking Revelations 3, which was written to disciples, people that had already been forgiven um, and was interacting with how Jesus was responding to their lukewarmness to then use that as theological basis for how someone receives salvation. You, you can immediately understand how problematic that is. Um, and honestly, as this type of idea became popular and preachers saw how quickly they could move people to make an emotional decision um, by, by using these words in this way. This idea of an outward sign of an inward grace in terms of baptism became popular. This was originally introduced by Zwingli, which was talked about in an earlier lesson, um, but that was an invention. Those words do not appear in the New Testament, and um, the only way you can read it into the New Testament is, is to kind of create it. Um, and so it didn't exist for all of this time, uh, but then once it got rolling, it was built into the psyche of many people that were trying to follow God. There was another invention during this time called the mourner's seat. 
Eliza Willock originally kind of created this and what he would do is he would gather up the people uh, that he felt like were kind of the most susceptible to change, maybe in the, the worst economic straits um, in, in some, site, some sort of sin, and he'd put them all in the front row. And he would call it as him in the pew, uh, in the uh, pulpit above, that salvation was looming over their heads. They'd have no one to hide behind, uh, no way to not meet his gaze. And uh, he found it that very, very often afterwards, those were those were the people quite open to uh, discussions and and changing their belief systems. But for many that witnessed this practice. They, they saw that false conversions were being created out of it and that it, um, it absolutely allowed people to make a quick decision that they did not actually count the cost of becoming a disciple. So moving on, another, another kind of moment in these revivals um, kind of coming out of the, the first great awakening and, and the awakenings that followed um, was this moment in Cane Ridge, Kentucky. And it lasted for weeks and it was the sensational revival. People barked, they rolled on the floor, they became delirious with hunger, the intense heat. And it absolutely was this emotional mockery of Christianity. J.V. Coombs later wrote, the appeal, songs, and prayers, and suggestion from the preacher drive many into the trance state. I can remember in my boyhood day, days seeing 10 or 20 people laying unconscious under the poor in the old country church, laying unconscious upon the poor in the old country church. People call that conversion. Science knows it is mesmeric influence, self-hypnotism. It is sad that Christianity is compelled to bear the folly of such movements. And unfortunately, thousands of people walked away from Cane Ridge, Kentucky, with this idea of this is what it means to have revival. This is what it means to be changed. Um, and that became a model that was later followed by others. A man, Charles Finney, kind of continued this practice, and he called it the, the anxious seat instead of the mourner seat, um, but really used the same type of, of emotional tactics um, to, to work. He wrote, the church has always felt it necessary to have something of this kind to answer this very purpose. In the days of the apostles, baptism answered this purpose. The gospel was preached to the people, and then all those who were willing to be on the side of Christ were called out to be baptized. It held the place that the anxious seat does now as a public manifestation of their determination to be Christians. <laughs> and so if you, you hear that paragraph closely, what he's saying is <laughs> using emotional tactics for people sitting in a front row that you are, are really browbeating with scriptures is the same as baptism. It's, it's the same expression of faith. Um, Steve Staten writes in his paper, in opposition to Finney's movement, John Nevin, a Protestant minister, wrote a book called The Anxious Bench. He intended to protect the denominations from this novel deviation. He called Finney's new measures heresy, a babble of extravagance, fanaticism, and quackery. He also said, with a whirlwind in, few, in few, full view, we may be exhorted reasonably to consider and stand back from its destructive path. It turns out that Nevin was somewhat prophetic. The system that Finney admitted had replaced biblical baptism is the vertebrae for the popular plan of salvation that was made normative in the 20th century by Billy Sunday, Billy Graham, and Bill Bright. So Dwight Moody and R.A. Torrey kind of continued this practice. And even though they understood, and it was already seen by the end of Finney's life, that what was happening with this anxious bench was leading to a high fallout rate, that people were leaving. They were saying yes, and then not following up with their life, which Jesus warns about. That's a worse state than to have never come to the truth at all. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, this... They led to another innovation called the inquiry room. 
And they said, okay, well, you know, maybe instead of browbeating people publicly, maybe if we bring them back and, and ask the possible converts some questions and, you know, teach them a little bit of scripture and then pray with them, that, that maybe that's how we ought to bring about salvation in their, in their life. And this became the birth of a systemic sinner's prayer, um, which you, you heard. Uh, and so <laughs> R.A. Torrey, he took this even further. Um, he would be kind of street preaching and just this idea of receive Christ now right here. And this is so dangerous, right? Because it led and brought into the, the world's conception, this idea that salvation was possible outside of church and outside of a life of disciple of lordship um, that you kind of could take those away as long as you use the right technique to receive christ and then you're good um, and this is this is dangerous theology and, and you know as we're kind of watching uh, slide by slide here it's clear to see how it became part of mainstream thought so billy sunday in the pacific garden mission um, took this idea even further, uh, popularized his ideas of these crusades um, using a salvation doctrine that was essentially just the simplified view of, of leading people to the sinner's prayer. Um, and uh, he combined ministry and entertainment. And, you know, if we think through televangelists now, we think through the, the idea of certain church conferences um, that are held with the idea of entertaining people instead of actually bringing them to, to God and bringing God's word to them, mixing comedy and, and scripture. And, you know, it's, it's not like there's not a place for, for a well-rounded sermon that includes multiple things, but just this idea that we are bringing the consumer, this crowd, a product, as opposed to offering people salvation and teaching them the ways of Jesus, a life of self-sacrifice. Those two things are not compatible. Moody and Sunday admitted of being ignorant of church history. So then Billy Graham and Bill Bright, they really refined the, the altar call system. Um, Bright created this form that can bring the crusade experience to homes and, and really like they, they went all around the country having these massive crusades. And the, they teach the four spiritual laws. It was like, okay, hey, this is hopefully enough to get people going. Um, and of course, the sinner's prayer is something along the lines of, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Taking control of the throne of my life, make me the kind of person you want me to be. And so you can even hear in that sinner's prayer, the connection to the misinterpretation in Revelations 3. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. And it's essentially taking what is a biblical plan of salvation and slowly piece by piece over time, dismantling it into something that you have where the person is, is offering that which leads to salvation without the lordship, without giving people an opportunity to, to measure the cost and see if they actually can build a tower and if they are able to do what they say and give their life fully to God. Uh, a telling sign in all this is that uh, Billy Graham's 1977 book, How to Be Born Again, does not include any reference to Acts 2, which is the hallmark rebirth event in Acts. Um, and so his, his emphasis, like the Acts 2, its emphasis on baptism and repentance for the forgiveness of sins was incompatible with this model of having a big event, leading people to, to make say a prayer and considering them saved and sending them on their way. Now, there was a translation uh, called the Living Bible, and you can actually see where theology was then, someone else's theology was inserted into God's word. Even in his own land and among his own people, the Jews, he was not accepted. Only a few welcomed and received him. But to all who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. All they needed to do was to trust him to save them. All those who believe this are reborn. Not a physical rebirth resulting from human passion or plan, but from the will of God. So that's the Living Bible translation, and everything italicized there does not have support in the original Greek. 
this translation was originally meant for children to try to help add some words to kind of hopefully give them better understanding, but it became a, a mainstay in this crusade moment um, because it's so closely aligned with this created theology that did not exist in John 1, 11 through 13. C.S. Lewis saw this mass adoption um, without backing or understanding and was moved by the chronological failure of humans to judge and review their own assumptions. He writes, most of all, perhaps we need intimate knowledge of the past. Not that the past has any magic about it, but because we cannot study the future and yet need something to set against the present to remind us that the basic assumptions have been quite different in different periods and that much which seems certain to the uneducated is merely temporary fashion. A man who has lived in many places is not likely to be deceived by the local errors of his native village. The scholar has lived in many times and is therefore in some degree immune from the great cataract of nonsense that pours from the press and the microphone of his own age. It's from his book, Learning in Wartime. Now, I myself would add that scholars themselves are susceptible to falling into the traps of being blind, especially if they remain separated from a living faith inside of a congregation. Um, but hopefully this story of how the sinner's prayer was created and how it kind of weaved through this history and weaved through this emotional movement uh, to how it became something that is widely accepted in Christianity today uh, is helpful in how we think about church history. I'm now gonna hand it over to Tom to talk about Pentecostalism. All right, thanks, Bobby. Uh, I appreciate Bobby has given me this chance to talk about Pentecostalism, knowing that um, I wrote a paper on its origins. And uh, so I'm, you know, having done all that work, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share a little bit of it with you. Can I get the next slide, Bob? Okay. So this is a picture of Charles Parham, who is considered the father of Pentecostalism. Uh, and what happened is that, um, you know, in the late 1800s or so, a lot of people, and this, there was this holiness movement, and a lot of people within this movement were seeking a second blessing that they called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, they understood that uh, you got the gift of the Holy Spirit at baptism, but they said, no, there's a second giving of it, the baptism of it. And in that, that's when you get that power that you see in the book of Acts. And uh, their claim was that, that the power that you see with the Holy Spirit had never been taken away. The problem was that the church had become so much like the world that nobody really had the faith to perform those miracles anymore. And so what they needed was this, this second blessing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to, to bring that, all of that power back. And it really appealed to a lot of people. So a lot of people were looking for it. Now, one guy in particular, Charles Parham, he was searching for this, and he had a like a Bible college that he opened and was, was teaching at a Bible school in Topeka, Kansas. And so his story really starts here in 1901 in Topeka, Kansas. He's really teaching his students about the Holy Spirit at the school, and he gives them an assignment. He wants them to study the book of Acts and look for the Holy Spirit. And what happens is that they all come to the same conclusion, that people who have the Holy Spirit speak in tongues. That's the conclusion that they all reach. And one of his students, a woman named Agnes Osman, starts begging him, please lay your hands on me and, and baptize me with the Holy Spirit. And he's like, I don't have the power to do that. But she's insistent. And so finally, he lays his hands on her, and she starts speaking in tongues. And for three days, she can only speak in this language, which she says is Chinese and is unable to speak in English. Well, soon all of these other students are speaking in some other language as well. And, and Parham is getting a little frustrated because this gift, uh, this gift of language had not come on him yet until eventually he starts speaking in what he believes is Swedish. Now, where she really speaks speaking in Chinese? Was he really speaking Swedish? I don't know. I, uh, probably not. But I mean, I'll say I'm skeptical. 
but that's what they believed. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so one of his students, after Topeka, he went to Houston and started another school. And one of his students you see in the picture there, his name is William Seymour. Well, Parham is called the father of Pentecostalism. Seymour is called the catalyst. And so because he was a black man and he went to this school, he uh, had to sit outside and listen through the window, but he was an avid student of the Bible. Uh, and eventually he gets hired by a church in Los Angeles. And when he gets there, he preaches for them for a couple of weeks, but they find his teaching too radical, too different from what they believed. And they, they, they lock the doors on him and change the keys. And so he shows up to preach one day and he can't even get in the building. And so he realizes he's been fired. And so now he's unemployed. He doesn't really have a place to live. And so he moves in with some friends and the three of them start a small prayer meeting. And they're, you know, they're all you know, showing the gifts of the Holy Spirit and this meeting grows and grows and grows and now it grows the house. So they rent a building there uh, in Los Angeles on Azusa Street. Now, the date here is really important. They opened the doors of this new church, the Azusa Street Mission, in April of 1906, okay? And there's some really unique things about this church. Their services will start at 10 in the morning and end whenever they end, might be midnight, okay? And it's completely spontaneous. Seymour believed that, that to have order in your service stifled the Holy Spirit. And so people would just get up and do whatever the Spirit moved them to do. If they wanted to sing, they'd get up and sing. If they wanted to sing in tongues, if they wanted to pray, if they wanted to speak, they would just do it. And so that was very unique, and it drew a lot of attention. But another thing that drew a lot of attention was it became an interracial fellowship, okay? He obviously uh, was a Black man. And if you look at the picture at the bottom, you can see a picture that was taken of one of their leadership groups, and you can see there are people uh, uh, are of, of different races, not just black and white either, but uh, they had leaders that were Spanish and, and things like that. And so this also drew attention to them because it's 1906, okay? Um, and that was very different. A lot of people didn't like it. Uh, and so the press started coming and writing all kinds of negative things about it. And then other people would read it and they would just come to watch. And, and observe what was going on there. But the message that really appealed to people was that the power of the Holy Spirit is available to you, and your life can really change. Well, people wanted that. People still want that. They want power. They want change in their life. And so they grew like crazy. Can I get the next slide? Okay, so the Azusa Street mission became this global phenomenon. Now, remember, they opened their doors in April of 1906. By November of 1906, so we're talking the same year, they had started churches in San Diego, Oakland, Santa Barbara, uh, Denver, uh, Seattle. They had opened and started a bunch of churches all over the place. And within three years, they had, they had started churches in three African nations and six Asian nations. And a big part of it was, wow, we've got this power and they, you know, the interesting thing to me was that they didn't see that the real power was this interracial fellowship. They thought the power was speaking in tongues. And so people were convinced that they were speaking these different languages. They hadn't really figured out yet that it wasn't another language. And there's one story of a family that, that were convinced they were speaking Bengali. Well, Bengali speakers are native to India. So they, they sold their house and packed up and because they believed that God wanted them to go to India to, to preach and, and to teach in Bengali, the language that the Spirit had gifted them. So they pack up, they move the whole family to India, only to find out that what they were speaking was not Bengali. What was it? Was it a different language? I don't really know. And to their credit, they stayed. Others got there, found out they weren't speaking what they thought they were speaking, and got discouraged and left. But that particular family stayed, to their credit. Uh, and so the Azusa mission 
starts this worldwide movement. Now, Azusa, the church itself, only lasted about 25 years, and only about, about five or six of them were, it was this meteoric thing that appeared and then just sort of vanished. Um, but it, it had a profound impact on the world. Uh, today, over 600 million people claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic in some form all over the world. It is by far the fastest growing movement, uh, religious movement out there. Um, and a lot of those churches claim roots back in Los Angeles at the Azusa Street Mission. Uh, so that's what I want to share about Pentecostalism, and uh, I will turn that turn it back over to you, Bob. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, so as we head into our last minute of the class here, uh, a couple of lessons to take away from what we've looked over tonight. One, a deteriorating world moves people to God. And, you know, I think often people can get discouraged by the state of society and how things are changing and, and, you know, a loosening of morals and these different things. But what we see across all of church history is that when things go bad in the world, people begin to wake up and turn to God. Um, we look at the history of Israel and we see that over and over again. And we see that throughout the entire study of the church. The next is to be wary of emotionalism being used as a weapon. This is not to say that reason always trumps emotion. Uh, the reality is emotions are very valuable and they teach us about ourselves and they teach us about each other and they teach us how to understand the world, but it can be weaponized to make people make quick decisions that are not long lasting and do not withhold the tests of this world. And finally, um, enthusiasm and convictions can wane. And what's wild is looking at different movement, movements that sprung up and then collapsed a couple generations later or became huge, but then became a shell of what it once was um, and, and turned to a route traditionalism that no longer was moving and shaping and, and moving people towards caring for the poor proclaiming God's good work, loving him with all of our heart, having lordship. Um, it's very frequent in church history that we see movements quickly created by people that were desperately trying to serve God, only to have a couple generations after them a, have an extreme weakening of their view of what a Christian life ought to be. So thank you so much for, for tuning in tonight. We'll have two more classes. Um, the next one will be, I'm sorry, I have the dates wrong here. It's um, the next one will be on the 16th, followed by the 23rd, the restoration movement and the history of the ICOC. Uh, first taught by Paige and Tom together, and then taught by Ted and Tom together. So thank you all for joining this evening. Uh, it was great to see you.